getting too far behind. So um, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Who was faithful to read this this week? All right. I'm not going to ask who. No, I am going to ask who wasn't. <laughs> nobody's going to raise. Nobody's going to raise their hand. <laughs> All right, First Corinthians chapter 13. I hope that you read it, um, and I hope that you really read chapters 12 through 14, so that you could capture this within its appropriate context, which is always something that we want to make sure we do with scripture study. Um, this this passage of scripture is no exception. In fact, it's going to be really helpful to understand it in its right context instead of the wrong one, which is what's typically done. So. <clears throat> Um, so uh, you should have your Bibles opened up there. We'll start to work through and read through this chapter here in just a minute. Um, but we're, we're continuing our, um, our biblical analysis of spiritual gifts and the way that God has designed them to operate within the church body. All right. Um, what is it that should truly distinguish God's churches and her members as being undeniably his? Very important question for us to ask and to answer. And I'm going to answer it right here at the beginning. Jesus made an amazing statement in John chapter 13 and verse 35 when he said this. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The word love used there and the word um, charity that we're going to see used here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 comes from the Greek word agape. It's purely a biblical word, purely biblical. It was not used in secular Greek language at all. Um, In scripture, that word is used to refer to the goodwill and the benevolence of God towards men. It's used to describe the goodwill or benevolence of God, the Father, towards Jesus Christ, of Christ then towards men, of men towards God, and then of God's people specifically, God's people only towards one another, right? Um, it, is, it is a reality that is inwardly experienced, and it is always outwardly displayed through the actions. It doesn't just stop within. It's so distinguishable, and it is so different from what the world can know and experience that it's highly visible to them. It's so countercultural that people can't help but pick up on it when they see it from God's people. And Jesus states that benevolence expressed toward one another in a local church will be the distinguishing characteristic that marks them. Now, the minute that we begin to speak about love, uh, many of us become a little bit nervous. We're nervous because we know that oftentimes an unbiblical concept of love becomes everything. And truth is cast aside or it's set aside in favor of that unbiblical notion. Now, there are people all around us who say, it doesn't matter what you believe and it doesn't matter how you live. God just says to love one another. (laughs) And by the way, love covers all things, right? Especially um, truth for that crowd. So uh, I want to give you an example. In the early centuries, There was a big debate, it was right around the middle of the third century, around the year 250, there was a big debate that occurred over what to do with people who during persecution recanted and denied the faith. Once the persecution was over, some of those folks wanted to be welcomed back into those churches that they had denied and left, and people wondered whether they really should be or not. Some people said, um, of course we should welcome them back in as long as they confess and repent. That's the biblical model. After all, Peter denied Christ under pressure. So who are we to deny forgiveness and restoration to those who do that as well? And other people then said, wait just a minute. If we allow these people back into our churches, then we're going to be dishonoring the martyrs who laid down their lives for the truth without compromising. A terrible precedent is going to be set for those who may follow suit whenever persecution breaks out. They'll be able to just deny the faith and have their churches take them right back in without issues. Um, And and so 
You had the truth people, right? And you had the love people. And it put tension into many churches. It caused many splits and fractures if you look at history. It came to be known as the Novation Schism. It involved truth versus love, or at least that was kind of at the root of it in people's minds. Well, I don't want to really go back and, and, uh, and analyze. I'm just trying to give you a quick example of something that is kind of, kind of difficult to work its way through. Um, the Bible says very clearly for us that there must be both. There must be balance between truth and love. Truth must be spoken in love. But the balance is admittedly difficult at times. But we do find a healthy balance when we surrender our hearts to the Lord and we follow hard after what he teaches us in the Bible. It makes it a lot easier. Well, today the pendulum is going to swing a little bit in the direction of love, folks, all right? So um, in the next chapter, we're going to swing um, uh, back to the other side, but I don't want you to look at it in the wrong way because we're not talking, as I'll say at the end here, about two opposite ends of a spectrum. These are things that must go together hand in hand if they're being properly and biblically applied. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is our focus. Paul actually begins the discussion in chapter 12 and verse 31. And after naming off a list of the gifts that we're going to start to cover in the upcoming weeks, he says this, but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And he's going to come back to talking about what it is in those best gifts in chapter 14. But he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. Um, and that's what he's going to begin to do in chapter 13 for us. Now, he's not saying in this, I want to make sure that we frame this right. He's not saying that the gifts are unnecessary or unimportant. That should be pretty evident to us already. If anything, we've already laid a pretty strong foundation for the critical use of all the gifts that God has given um, by all the members that God has given to the body if a church is going to do anything worthwhile for him. But something foundational that has to underlay all the gifts is developed here for us in chapter 13 or beginning in chapter 13. It's more excellent than all the gifts. It is. It's more excellent than being a good prophet. It's more excellent than being a good teacher. It's more excellent than being a good speaker in tongues. What is more excellent to God? Who gave the gifts and inspired the very words that we're going to read here. But it is the motive and it is the mindset and it is the heart of God's child in using those gifts within the body. Now don't forget what we've already studied that God himself has personally and intentionally added each and every member to this church. And God has intentionally given the gifts that he wants to each and every one of us so that we can appropriately play our part in the symphony. Remember that word? Um, in the symphony that God seeks to conduct here. And so because this chapter is a chapter on love, let me just take your... Uh, take you by the hand very lovingly and gently, and we're going to walk through this together today. It's a fantastic chapter. It is wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to see this truth in its proper context, all right? So let's start. Verses 1 through 3, Paul tells us undeniably how necessary charity is. Charity is necessary. Now, um, I'll read the verses in just a second, but Paul's just speaking hypothetically as he leads in here into verse 1, and he's going to use some of the most exaggerated language possible in his illustrations, and he gives us examples from all three categories of spiritual gifts. He talks about the temporary miraculous sign gifts. He talks about some speaking gifts, and he talks about some service gifts. And so he covers the whole gamut of it. He doesn't want anything to be left out of this illustration. And I'm not going to spend much or really any time on the individual gifts because we're going to be unpacking the specifics of those gifts in the weeks ahead. But he begins in verse 1, and he says this. Everybody here can probably quote these verses. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels... And that should tell us real quick, he's speaking hypothetically, because as far as I know, no person has ever spoke with an angelic tongue before. That's what makes it angelic. But though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. He doesn't say, I sound 
like a sounding brass, or I'm going to come across as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. He says, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Folks, uh, I want you to see this. We're talking about the necessity of charity here to start out. I am sounding brass. I'm just clanging noise. If I exercise a gifting as a member of God's church without charity. He continues in verse 2 and he says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge... Um, these are gifts that have to do with a mastery of the word of God. Um, today, we already considered just a little bit about what the mysteries are, right? They involved knowledge that no natural man would ever arrive at. And so it required the special revelation of God's truth to people. We have that in and through the word of God today. And so a man may have the gift of declaring God's word and having God's truth illuminated very clearly to his mind and fail to possess a heart connection to that mental comprehension of God's truth. And he says, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. This is a person we'll see who has supreme confidence in the word of God, doubting nothing about what God says. But though a person may have all those gifts that he's just spoken of, if he or she is devoid of charity in the motive and in the, in the application of those gifts, what does he say? I am nothing. Certainly nothing will be accomplished. Maybe damage will be accomplished at best. Nothing will be accomplished. But I, in God's consideration, according to his word here, am absolutely nothing. It's a serious business. Now, uh, intrinsically, we should all understand that we really are nothing. We really are worthless. And there's nothing worthwhile about us except what God installs in us. But what a tragedy. If even what God puts in us in the form of his gracious gifts is cast aside and we make it nothing, and we're worth nothing as a result. Now, Paul continues in verse 3 by, by speaking about one of the service gifts, the gift of giving, which is almost synonymous with an understanding of what biblical love really is. It, it is the quintessential example of charity because charity gives and sacrifices for another. And so he says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and even lay down my life for another, which if you remember is the greatest outward expression of charity according to Jesus Christ. A man lays down his life for his friends. If it's not motivated and energized by inward charity, all that outward production profiteth me nothing. In other words, nothing is bettered by it. Nothing is gained by it. There is no, to put it in, in really biblical terms from our context, nothing is edified by it. Okay? So as we consider all the gifts that God describes for us through his word, and as we analyze how they are to be biblically employed within the ministry of this church right here, just like at Corinth, but in True North Baptist Church, this foundational concept must be in place. It's got to be there. A sincere, benevolent goodwill that's directed first towards God himself, but primarily in our context towards one another in this church body. If that's in place, hear me, if that's in place, there won't generally be any rubs between the diverse members and the gifts that God places in this body. There won't be. There will be no self-will that is portrayed from one member to another. There will be no self-focus. We're going to operate like God operates. And like God intends, we saw back at the beginning of chapter 12 that when we recognize all these truths, every person will profit with all. Do you remember that phrase? That was the Greek word simpero. Um, regardless of what our gifting is, we will be like a symphony and we will each one of us add to the body rather than causing dissonance within God's orchestra. Folks, um, I have to realize this, and I hope that you realize this. You can grasp all of the mental things, and you can do all of the outward things. 
But if the heart is not engaged in charity and the love of God is not being shed abroad in your heart, it amounts to zero. And so Paul shows us that charity is is absolutely foundationally necessary as we discuss this topic. Now, the danger is that we just sit here and we shake our heads mentally acknowledging this. Yeah, I've heard this a million times, but not really taking it to the heart level. So would you ask God as we dig into this and ask him to, to expose to the deepest recesses of your heart and life whether you've really been committed on this level? And I'm not just talking about committed to some generic concept of, yeah, we need to be loving within the church body, but I'm talking about between every single member here in this body, because that's what we're dealing with. That is what the scriptures are expressing. If you're not willing to do that, if you don't do that, then you're not going to benefit from the course of this study. Neither will the church body. And so, first of all, we see that charity is absolutely necessary. It is essential. Secondly, Paul emphasizes that charity is special. It is special. Or we could say it is unique. If you want to see something truly contrary to human nature, listen to what Paul says here. It just humbles me. Every time I read and I think through these thoughts, I ask everybody here to commit this portion of Scripture to memory with me. I've done that, um, and over the years, I constantly recall and dwell on these things that are stated here. Now, what I want you to see is that as we move into verse 4, Paul doesn't define charity for us. He doesn't. He describes it in action. Frankly, a mere definition of this word just leaves us fairly devoid of understanding. I already defined it somewhat, right? The word means goodwill or benevolence. Okay, you know, it's it's kind of a pie-in-the-sky kind of idea. There needs to be specific application, right? And so the description of it here is powerfully contrasted against everything that makes us human. Did you hear me? It, It contrasts against everything in our humanity. It shows us what a truly divine quality we're dealing with here. Just as the gifts of God to a church body are supernatural gifts, that which fuels the spiritual gifts is supernatural in its origin, and it is supernatural in its application. Only as we stay linked at the heart level to our first love, Can we benefit this church body through the gifts that God entrusts to us? And so Paul describes two positives and then eight negatives and then some positives again so that we can really grasp. And, you know, he he just kind of paints a a little bit of a picture for us. And it's a whole lot easier to read a book that has pictures, right? Maybe not even read at all, but just look at pictures. So he gives us those. As we consider these descriptions, I have no doubt that... Memories of personal experiences will flood to your mind and should flood to your mind as we realize that this is talking about the close personal relationships in which God's gifted church members are required to work together. Some of those may be positive memories. Some of them may be very negative memories. But I'd ask that rather than looking at somebody else down the aisle, within our church body, whom you perceive has failed in some area, lay your heart at Jesus' feet right now and be examined by him. Because we'll want to know, or I would hope that you want to know as well as I do, am I demonstrating charity? I've got to get this area fixed. If it's not, if it needs fixing, I've got to make sure that it is foundationally solid so that we have something to go forward on in this study. So charity is described in this way. Charity suffereth long. And I'm going to give you just a brief definition and description of each one of these phrases. Charity suffereth long. It's patient. That's what it means. It's patient. It is able to endure what it encounters without any retaliation. Charity suffereth long. Charity is kind. It repays hurt and insult, and even slander 
with kindness. That's how it responds. It's not the, the kind of response that says, you did this to me, and I'm going to react back. Charity doesn't have to get even. It's kind. It's irrational and unnatural to the human mind because our human tendencies are always to quickly retaliate and repay in kind. Charity doesn't because it isn't human. It's, it's an unnatural thing. It, goes, it runs contrary to the typical human responses. And so those are the first two um, positive statements that are made. It suffereth long. There's patience. It doesn't retaliate. It's kind. It repays Insult with kindness. And then the negatives come. Charity envieth not. Friends, char what, what this is saying is that charity delights in the successes of other members of this church body. And I want you to really put this to application in your minds. It's not jealous. It doesn't resent those more successful, smarter, richer or with a better family. It doesn't resent those that have different giftings or abilities that might seem superior to yours. No. A clear demonstration that charity is in the heart is when members rejoice that someone is promoted over you and blessed more than you. In context, why wouldn't it function that way? <laughs> he just got done saying this, whether one member suffer all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. There's no envy there. God put that member in the body. God honored that member. God gifted that member. We're partners striving together uh, for the same objective and in the same body. And the body was just strengthened through that member's promotion What's to lose in that? We just gain in that. Now, it's human nature to envy and to immediately compare somebody else's successes to my perceived lack in any area. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody who's a one-upper? Or, or one who hears of somebody else's victory and somehow turns it into a conversation about them? Charity envieth not. There is no self-focus in charity. When it comes to hearing of the victory of someone else, there is a rejoicing in that because the body is strengthened and now as a unit we're able to do greater things together. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. Have you ever met a braggart? Can't stop talking about themselves? not charity. Charity's not like that. It is an intentional setting of self aside, focusing on others, and even crafting opportunities to edify others. Now, it's natural to do the opposite. And remember that if you want to um, if you want to evaluate whether you personally are at any given moment being led by the Holy Spirit in your thinking and in your speech, stop and consider whether you were letting things naturally flow in your mind, in your heart, and in your words, and in your actions. Are things just naturally flowing out without pausing and without really considering and intentionally crafting what you're doing? Um, if you're being intentional as a spiritual person, then you're going to choose to demonstrate charity. But that means reeling in the natural responses that we have of vaunting ourselves. Now, chances are, since, um, since uh, operating intentionally in this way doesn't come naturally, you don't even really have to evaluate hard because if you're not being intentional, then you're being natural. Charity vaunteth not itself. And it says charity is not puffed up. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue to, to drill this, I hope, because I don't want to, anybody to deviate off in their thinking a different direction. We're talking about interactions between the body, members of the body. And the way that we would interact in real time as we bump into different circumstances in our church body. Charity is not puffed up. This phrase comes from a Greek word that means to inflate. The one doing the inflating isn't God here. He hasn't promoted somebody. This is carnal nature alone. It means to be proud, simply put. It means to be proud. The word is used seven times in the New Testament. This phrase, puffed up, in the Greek word that it comes from. Six of those times are in the book of 1 Corinthians. Six out of seven. Where Paul charges that to the members of the church at Corinth. And he tells them over and over, ye are puffed up. Ye are puffed up. Over and over he says that to them. It was clearly evidenced among them because they had divisions. They were puffed up. And Proverbs tells us that only by pride cometh contentions. If there's contentions, rest assured, biblically um, uh, founded truth. If there's contention, one or both parties are operating in pride. Anytime there is an inflated heart about oneself, it can't help but cause division within the members of a local church because it's not going to permit the body parts to appreciate each other. It's going to lead one to think that it's more important and useful than it really is, and it's going to handicap the body. Anytime, folks, anytime you sense even a hint of divisiveness or division in your heart, Immediately stop and measure yourself by this scripture and realize, I don't have charity. This is not charity that's showing here. So, it's not puffed up. Charity, goes on, doth not behave itself unseemly. <laughs> that comes from a Greek word. The word unseemly, it comes from a Greek word that means unbecoming. It's used in another place, one other place in the Bible. It's used in 1 Corinthians um, in an earlier chapter to refer to inappropriate behavior of a man towards a young woman. Unseemly. He's focused on gratifying himself and inconsiderate about the purity and the character and the reputation of the other person. In that case, a young lady. He's willing to step on her to satisfy himself rather than considering her. Now, whether you're, re you're interacting with men or women within the church body, charity doesn't do those kind of things. The members of Christ's body aren't to be that way. They don't gain personally at the expense of another. Charity seeks to lay down itself for the highest benefit of the other. It is sinful human nature that thinks about self at the expense of another. Next, it says, charity seeketh not her own. That means it doesn't insist on its own way. Charity enables a mem the members of a church to happily submit to one another even when their opinions differ from each other. Did you hear me? It enables members of a church to happily submit to one another even if their opinions differ. Charity um, sees that it doesn't have to be my way. Now that's not natural for us, is it? I'm trying to hammer this, this reality. It's not natural. We must put down the natural response. This is the product of God alone, not of man. Charity is not easily provoked. That means it doesn't lose its temper. The wrath of man never, ever, ever works the righteousness of God. And therefore, whenever one of God's people loses their temper... They are not being led by the Holy Spirit, and they are not operating in charity. In that moment, they will only ever destroy. They'll never edify. Now get this in your heart, and keep the descriptions that he's giving um, in the context of how individual church members are to interact. There's never a time when church members should lose their temper and fight. Never. The Holy Spirit... The Holy Spirit is not leading in that instance, and those members should immediately check themselves, get on their knees together, and cry out for God's forgiveness and for His leadership to come back in because they're not being led by the Spirit. Um, but that's what choosing charity is going to do. 
charity thinketh no evil. And this refers to keeping an account of or record of wrongdoings. We talked about it already this morning, right? Thinketh no evil. It's the same as accounting that we looked at. Um, we're not keeping an account of wrongs that have been committed against us. There's not a ledger that's being kept. Charity doesn't keep a private file of grievances that's stacked up for years and pulled back out whenever I want to. Charity will lead people in one of two ways. It'll either lead people to forbear if a perceived wrong is done, in which case it's intentionally set aside and forgotten about. Or it's going to go and it's going to address a matter with humility, exactly how Jesus said to deal with strifes or divisions within a church. And the objective is, again, to gain back your brother, not to win an argument. <laughs> when that's done... Again, you intentionally set aside the grievance and you march forward together hand in hand with your brother or with your sister and your relationship is strengthened as a result of that and the church is strengthened and edified. I've even applied this principle with lost people, people in the workplace, and they're blown away by it. They don't know what to do because it's something that no person will ever do if they're operating from human nature. But charity makes this choice. Thinketh no evil. It keeps no accounts. Charity rejoiceth not in iniquity. It doesn't delight when it hears about some sin or some failure on the part of another, particularly not another church member. What it does instead, charity is going to cause the heart to be grieved and to be crushed when it hears about some sin or failure on the part of a heart, uh, on the, in the life of a church member, and it's going to move a person to help that fallen brother or sister get back up. It doesn't go talk to others and say, especially about a person that you don't really like very much, you won't believe what so and so did. But that's just like him, isn't it? Folks, charity doesn't slander. It doesn't spread stories, even if they're true, if they're negative stories. It seeks to protect the reputation and the character of its fellow members while dealing appropriately with the sin. Uh, what it does seek to share around is truth, right? It rejoices not in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It looks for truth to share. It edifies and it lifts fellow members up by praising truth that is seen in them. I personally found that this is one of the most edifying things that I can do. If you ever really want to edify somebody, there's something good that you can share, go tell it to somebody else about them and let it circle around and get back to them. It's extremely edifying. We're not trying to build people's egos up, but it's extremely edifying. I tell the truth when I do it. Um, when it comes back around to them, it is a huge encouragement to them in their service in the Lord's work. And there are heart strings that then are bound together stronger and stronger between the church members. And so charity is going to pray for and it's going to protect one another's reputation, never rejoicing when somebody else falls, not on any level. As a result, it never spreads rumors and it never talks about wrongdoing unless it's to the people who are the part of the problem to whom it needs to be addressed. This isn't normal. This isn't natural. This is a special creation of God. Now we come back to the positive qualities again in his descriptions. And he says, charity beareth all things. And I want to emphasize the word all to you because it's going to be used over and over through this verse. It beareth all things. In the context of the members in the church body, we saw already that God sticks them together. Now, all the preceding descriptions should generally keep members from even getting to this point where they have to bear all things. But considering that there are different levels of spiritual maturity in church members, what do you do with members that you just don't like? <laughs> what do you do physically if you don't like some feature about your body? Well, I'll say that you just need to fundamentally change the way that you're thinking. You're thinking carnally. And you're thinking immaturely about the wrong things. And frankly, you should be, uh, you should be uh, or should not be thinking about a, uh, a part of your body in that light at all. 
You may not like that you have short legs or long legs. You should just be glad that you have legs because some people don't have any. <laughs> be thankful to God because you can't change it. Isn't that exactly what Jesus said? He said, stop worrying about that kind of stuff. You can't add a cubit to your stature or take away a cubit if you want to. You can't make one hair of your head white or black. Be thankful to God. The word beareth from the Greek, it simply means this. It means to cover your mouth. Keep silent about something. That's what it means to bear all things. By the way, you show maturity when you do that. You may still need to fundamentally change your heart and your thinking about that other member in the body that you don't like very much. And you're going to do that when you apply all these descriptors together. By the way, this isn't normal. It's pretty normal for us in human nature to kind of characterize people in a certain way. And we have people that we like and that we get along with and people that we don't like and don't get along with very well. Right? We're constantly making judgments and forming opinions that way. That's natural. This is unnatural. You bear all things. Charity believeth all things. The word believe is exactly the same word that's used for saving faith throughout the Bible. It means that it chooses to place trust and confidence in someone. That's something that you have to choose to do. It doesn't happen naturally. Who are you placing trust and confidence in here? The other members of the body. Now, this requires some really intentional effort, but it goes beyond trusting those members to really trusting God who personally added them and their gifts to the body in the first place. Charity believeth all things. Charity hopeth all things. The word hopeth is distinguished from believeth in that it is confidence in what the future is going to bring. It's an optimism that since God's Holy Spirit is the one who places those people in the body and gifts them with specific functions, we can confidently expect that he's going to grow them and mature them in their proper functions, and our church is going to be edified as a result of it. I can optimistically and joyously hope in that, and I can still serve together with people in the meantime. The hope is both in the Lord, and the hope is placed in my fellow church members. Charity endureth all things. <laughs> and that's the way that this description really rounds out for us endures all things. The word endureth means to persevere uh, or to abide rather than fleeing from something. Now, I know I keep saying this, but remember the context. You are added by the Lord to a local church membership, and he has a specific reason for having put you into it. Don't flee. Faithfully abide. I hope that this description has put this passage into a bit of a different light because while these are all valid descriptors of the way that charity will be seen in action in all areas of a believer's life, it is particularly talking about the function of the local church body and the way that we're to shape our hearts and our minds so that we can fully appreciate the Lord, one another, and use the spiritual gifts right. And if we don't put these uh, these into action, they won't be used right, and we won't appreciate one another, and frankly, we won't appreciate the Lord. Now, I also hope that, that this, so far, before we move on, has made it very clear that this is not the kind of behavior that you're going to see in the workplace. It's not the kind of behavior that you're going to see in the culture. It is not the kind of behavior, frankly, that we're going to see really even in homes in general, though it should be a part of godly homes. This is a supernatural kind of love that we're talking about that runs counter to every fiber of our natural state. It is supernatural love. It should be so striking to the world's people that it singles out God's people with the sharpest contrast. And so we've said that a charity is necessary. Charity is unique. It is uniquely different in that it is a divine quality rather than a natural quality. And then number three today, charity is eternal. And that's really what we see as we look at these last couple of verses in this chapter. It is eternal. Now, this is another thing that distinguishes it and sets it apart so clearly. Verse 8 says this, charity never faileth. 
But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. In that, in that sense, even looking to this future eternal context, there's not even a mention of spiritual gifts anymore at that point in time, but faith, uh, hope, charity. But the greatest of these is charity. Now, again, I'm not going to dwell much on the gifts that are mentioned here, other than to say that some of them, um, some of the temporary gifts served their purpose and then passed away. We'll consider those in coming weeks. But they are contrasted very sharply against faith, hope, and charity. By the way, someday faith is going to give way to sight and there won't need to be faith anymore. Someday hope is going to be unnecessary because hope will be reality. What's going to abide eternally is charity. That's what God says is the more excellent way. Charity is at the heart of it all right now and forever into eternity. Now, um, we've emphasized that we're talking about a supernatural kind of love here. And that's why it's so important to realize that love is the distinguishing mark of one of the Lord's churches. Because we don't have this kind of love naturally. Uh, there's a big difference, and it's important for us to contrast human love and divine love here before we close today. Human love is dependent on the one who is loved. People love others, humanly speaking, because they're lovable. They love others for what those others will do for them. They love others because of the way that others make them feel. They love others because they think it'll help advance them. They love others because of what they get out of it. That's human love. And there are two things that attract us to other people on a human level. And I'm drawing this out because we need to clearly see it because we frequently see this right here within our church and we've got to be careful to guard against it. It means that charity is not at work if these types of motives are in place. Two things that tend to attract us to other people on a human level. The first is appearance. It's a reality. It's a human reality. Some people are just born beautiful. I can look over this congregation right now and I can see people um, that, that are just truly beautiful people. Um, I imagine when, uh, when you were a baby, your mom probably got stopped in the store all the time because people wanted to look at you and see you smile and talk to you. The rest of us just had to keep rolling by in the cart. Nobody wanted us to stop. But beauty, beauty is a tremendous advantage, right? Physically speaking, we're attracted to people who are beautiful. That's just human love or human attraction. The second thing is personality that attracts us to people. Some people just exude charisma and energy and charm. They make you feel good when you're around them. Now, of course, um, for uh, this is something I would say that especially ladies get enamored with, with certain men. But there's a good chance that he's actually concealing all kinds of hidden motives and insecurities, and even vileness under the surface. But that person just puts you at ease. And what isn't realized is that it is human love that's based upon the one who is loved, right? He loves you because of what he thinks you can do for him, and you love him based on what he is providing to you or the way that he makes you feel. The Song of Solomon is a poem about human love. Uh, it's a man who's singing to his wife. Uh, behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. <laughs> thy, hair, <laughs> thy hair is as a flock of goats <laughs> that appear from Mount Gilead. Thy teeth are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which come up from the washing. 
whereof everyone bare twins, and none is barren among them. Thy lips are like a thread of scarlet, and thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of pomegranate. <laughs> are you enjoying this? Uh, it's probably the closest to poetry that my wife is ever going to hear. Uh, but uh, thy, neck, thy neck is like the Tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty... Well, uh, anyway... You'll see that that's, he's, he's, he's full of charm, right? And he's charming this lady. And you'll see that she responds back to him by admiring that charisma and the attention that he shows her. That's human love. He loves her for her beauty. She loves him for his charisma and his strength. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with human love. But the problem is that human love can't endure the storms. It's temporary, it's fleeting, it's not eternal in nature. And that's why we have such a monstrous divorce rate in our society today. Because marriages that are built on nothing more generally won't stand the test of time. I've known soldiers who've suffered debilitating, um, permanently debilitating injuries or disfigurement. And their wives left them to find somebody now who was healthier and more attractive than they were. <laughs> that's human love. Human love will continue as long as the other person is doing something for them or there's something to gain. But when the other person stops doing things for them or, or that person changes in some way or that person causes difficulty or hardship enters the relationship for some reason, they're out of there because human love can only take so much. It's only divine love that endures. Now, friends, it is the love of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that endures. It endures all things. Human love says, what's in it for me? What will benefit me the most? Contrast that with divine love. Divine love is not based on the one who is loved. It's based on the lover. Primarily, it's based on God and his character. But uh, uh, it is something then that is reflected in and through our lives. Divine love will continue despite any circumstances. Because the love of God has been shed abroad in that person's heart by the Holy Spirit that's given unto them. As a result, they can endure all things. It's the kind of love that God had for us. Romans chapter 5 makes this very plain to us when it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Now this is human love. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. For adventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us before there was any response from us. He loved us when we were in rebellion. He loved us when we were entirely unlovable. That comes from God, never from the natural man, because it's based on God's character, not on man. That's why divine love is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. In reality, when we read through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we really have a discussion of what the fruit of the Holy Spirit looks like. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the very first thing that's mentioned. Agape comes from above. It originates with God. It's never generated by your nature, and it's never generated by my nature. It comes to us from God. That's the only reason that we're able to love in this way. Are you getting this? <laughs> I hope that you're getting this. This was one of the real issues in the church at Corinth. They weren't comprehending this, were they? And so the fruit wasn't being produced. And so they couldn't stand each other. And so they were divided into factions. And so they were warring with one another. Now, there are some here today who don't understand that work of the Spirit because you've never been saved. Some of you have trusted Christ, but your heart hasn't given the Holy Spirit of God an opportunity to work in you. And as a result, there's no help from God in the midst of your situation. And your, uh, the fruit of your life is resentment and bitterness and anger and gossip and distrust and quick-temperedness and other poor fruit that is exactly the opposite of what charity will produce in the church membership. Uh, may I say that we all need God to radically reshape our thinking in this area. There's a man by the name of Charles um, Weigel. He actually sang a song that he wrote this morning. 
lived many years ago, he wrote the song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. One evening he was speaking at a conference in Pasadena, California. And when he came into the building, somebody said to him, Hey, brother, did you enjoy the Rose Gardens? And he said, yeah, I did. And he thought that maybe that person had seen him there. Uh, and somebody else came in and said to him, hey, did you enjoy the Rose Gardens? And he started to think, man, I wonder how many people were out there. I, I guess a lot of people saw me. And so he said, yeah, I enjoyed it. And, and then another person came and said, hey, did you enjoy the Rose Gardens today? And finally, he, uh, after this happening four or five times, he said, hey, how come all of you guys know that I was in the Rose Gardens? And they said, oh, that's because you brought the fragrance of the roses in with you. Now, I have to ask this question very distinctly to every one of God's people here. How are people going to know that you've been with Jesus Christ? How are people in your family, in your workplace, throughout the community, and especially right here within this very church body, going to know that you've been in the presence of Jesus? It's only going to happen if you carry his fragrance along with you. Frankly, you won't even have to tell people that you belong to Jesus Christ because they'll be able to see and experience his fragrance emanating from your life. His love, his caring, his concern is going to clearly shine through because our selfish interests have been put to death and have been put aside. Remember what Jesus said in the first verse we looked at, by this shall all men, that would include us with one another, know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. That's what 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is all about. I ask that every person here would be brutally hard on yourself in analyzing from this scripture. Examine your heart in this matter. Repent where necessary. Intentionally reshape your thinking. And let's, let's get ourselves set for God to really do ministry through us as we join together in charity within this body. All right. Okay, I'm done.